Hi, welcome to Eye Openers. I'm your host, Brittany Drozd, and each week I bring you insightful conversations with entrepreneurs that will help you make more money, become a strong leader, and build a business culture that you're proud of. Grab your coffee and let's dive in. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Eye Openers. We have my friend Peter here with us today. Good morning, Peter. How are you? Uh, Very good. Good morning. Well, I realize actually some people, it might not be morning for them, but it really shouldn't matter because you should be having an eye-opening beverage anyway when you tune in. So what is that for you today? What are you drinking, Peter? Uh, My standard is uh, Venti Dark Gross with uh, three shots of espresso. Okay. Is that a Starbucks? Is Starbucks correct? I think this is our first time with the Starbucks cup. Can you believe that? Like I do these coffee interviews. I've been doing it for like a year and a half and nobody's actually shown up with a Starbucks cup before. And I love it because I actually grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So anywhere you could, you know, essentially walk to, there was Starbucks on every corner. Um, but then I lived out East for the past 15 years and there was way less Starbucks. There was Dunkin' Donuts everywhere. You guys, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I don't know if it's because I was raised on this strong, bold, ulcer-inducing coffee that I just like needed, um, or it was just the slight burnt taste that Duncan always seemed to have. I just couldn't do it. But there were no drive throughs out East, no Starbucks drive throughs So you guys, that is my first world problem that I was dealing with. But for you, that's not a problem. We've got the Starbucks. Correct. Yes. We're, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> several nearby. So we're good. We're covered. And this is a black copy. Yeah. Black with three shots of espresso. That is just like, man, you are intense. I can feel it through the screen. I w- got to see you in person sometimes just to feel the energy. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm on day three of black coffee. This is new for me. Okay. It takes a little bit of getting used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it started uh, years ago, black coffee, because as an architect, we would go to the construction uh, offices out in the field. Yeah. And uh, there's no way I was going to put that fake creamer in the coffee. <laughs> the ones that sit out all day. You're like, how is this real? <laughs> right. No, I, like, I'm good with the black. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Well, you know, my, um, trainer, nutritionist person just said, you just got to get rid of that dairy. We got to take that crutch away. So I'm trying it. I yeah. asked my clients to get really uncomfortable and try new things. I got to do it too. So this is my edge today. Let's, but I heard you have two drinks. Uh, correct. Yes. I have some fresh squeezed beet juice. Fresh squeezed beet juice. The question is, are you doing the squeezing? Uh, yes. Yes. Let's yeah. see your hands then. Because you know, if you mess with beets. Well, well, <laughs> this is after a workout and after a shot. Okay. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> I feel like my hands are red for days <laughs> when I cook with beets. But maybe it's oh. just me. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, the mother of all um, the juicers. So that, that oh, thing's cool. the machine. Yeah, that thing is oh. a machine. I love beet juice. That's awesome. So that's another first. Full of firsts here, Peter. Okay. Love it. Fabulous. Um, so I want to give you a real introduction now. People are like, okay, enough with the guy with all the espresso shots and the beet juice. Why, why should we care? Why are we tuning in? Well, the truth is, is that Peter is kind of special because you're, the way that you have been living your life, aligning it with your values and what you really want to create for yourself along with your professional life and the business you've built. So guys, you're going to want to pay attention to how he has done this, but a kind of formal official bio, if you will, is that Peter is the president and founder of Circle West Architects. You guys develop the needs and aspirations of your clients with inventive, engaging, built environments. You listen, you collaborate, and are passionate about your work. How did I do? That's kind of brief. Is there something you want to elaborate on before we jump into all the questions? No, that that's good. I'll just go with that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> How many years have you guys been in business? Uh, well, uh, I founded the company in 1992, so this August will be 30. 30 years. What are you guys going to do? Is there going to be a party? 
Oh yeah. 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 Yes. We're we're working on that. We're working on it. Yeah. Very cool. How exciting. 30 years. You know what I love about having my like super veteran business owners on here is that one, there, there are endless stories about things that have happened in your business, but there is such a, in my opinion, a kind of like calmer, more settled in demeanor that my veteran entrepreneurs have about them. Um, that I find really reassuring. I'm only 10 years in, just shy of 10 years. And a lot of my clients are less than that. And there is this like unsettledness about the up and down uncertainty and the roller coaster that they're still kind of getting used to riding and myself too sometimes. And I just feel like there's more of an ease about the people who have been at this longer that maybe you have found a way to get off the roller coaster or just like go for the ride, I guess, and like let go and just enjoy it. Uh, What do you think that is? Do you experience that yourself internally, or maybe you just look at, make it look cooler than, uh, than it feels? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) In part, I would agree with you. In other words, you know, the years do uh, settle you down. So you don't go as high and you don't go as low, Mm. but I, what motivates me is I think Bill Gates said a quote a while back that I always have in my mind is this uh, fear is the greatest motivator. Mm-hmm. So uh, with our company, with myself and how we've grown and how we started, we never had a safety net. I never had a safety net in a way. So that mindset has always propelled me and us to achieve some spectacular achievements, in my opinion. And you're speaking financially is what I'm assuming, right? So yeah. there's no, there was no financial safety net. There was nobody coming to save you if this didn't work out or if you know you made a big mistake. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we grew, uh, as we started, it was very small. And then uh, as an architect, and then we, you know, gradually, step by step, we got involved in larger projects. And then we kind of catapulted to another level. And then, um, you know, that really honed uh, our skills and my management skills. So let's talk about that catapult. What happened? What would you attribute that um, that moment in growth to? Let's break it down because a lot of our listeners, they haven't had that catapult yet and they're holding on, right? And they're on that roller coaster ride and they're anxious about it. So help us understand like what brought you to that catapulting moment? What things happened or what evolved in your leadership or management or whatever that allowed that? Well, let me start a little bit uh, backwards. So as a younger architect in Chicago, I worked at a great firm, Auburn Group. And um, within that firm, so at the time it was a very large firm, so they're still very successful. And, um, but you're working in a team environment, you know, and you're involved with the team, no, no question about it. But then when you break out on your own, it's a totally different animal. It's a totally, you're responsible for every minute decision, you know, buying a pencil, uh, yep. you know, anything, anything <laughs> like that. Um, so um, I always, Personally and professionally, I always love a challenge. Um, and uh, I love challenges. I love challenging myself and to aspire to greatness and to excellence. And, uh, you know, how do you do that? And it's not, the, the, there's not always a clear, organized, rational path. Like you do these five things and you're going to be great. It's not exactly like that. Right. And uh, so it's a little bit uh, that, um, you, I'm fortunate with being surrounded with people, my mentors at the firm at Auburn Root and growing up with my parents, you know, they instilled in me a lot of self-confidence and pursuit of excellence. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a value that you already held. Like whatever it is I set out to do, I want to be a master at it. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, absolutely. I stand on their shoulders. In, in that way, you know, and there's uh, a pride knowing that. So um, when I started the firm and it started growing little by little, and then that catapult, uh, okay, can we literally design and plan the projects at a larger scale, much more complicated, much larger in scale financially, a uh, 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 totally different type of clientele, very sophisticated client. Um, a lot of variables moving around financially. And so uh, I put it upon myself to look at that as a challenge 
I happen to race triathlons and run all kinds of endurance races and things like this. Like in a marathon or anything like that, the way I look at it is I don't think about the 26 miles. You know, I don't think like, oh my God, I, you know, can I run the 26 miles? So what I've learned to do is really break it down, mm-hmm. break it down in stages or phases, how you want to describe it and set specific goals for each stage. And so um, when you look at an architectural design firm specifically, you know, there's various aspects. There's the design of the building. There's the management of the people, the architects and our, all our subconsultants. There's presentations and communications with uh, the city or municipality, our client various community stakeholders. There's financial responsibility. And, and then there's, you know, what I would call technical responsibility, meeting all the applicable codes. So uh, when you think of it, you think, oh my God, it's a marathon. How am I going to do this? But when you, what I try to do is break it down into those different areas, subject matters, and just uh, fragment each one and, and be very resourceful and honest with yourself what you could do and what you can't do and where you need to bring in the expertise. So part of the success of catapulting is being a very efficient problem solver. And you're resourceful with solving the problems where you don't need to be dependent upon yourself to solve the problems necessarily, but you need to acknowledge the challenge and then bring in the resources and people to solve whatever that problem or challenge is. Mm-hmm. And I like to say, uh, you know, culturally in our firm, you should do that with a smile and a very high level of enthusiasm. And uh, because we do that every day, we do that today, we do that tomorrow, we, we did that yesterday. Uh, well, that's literally what you do as an architect, right? I mean, you take a design challenge and you literally solve for every single problem within it until you have a design of a, of a building, a structure or whatever that is going to have the integrity, is going to have the design excellence, right? And the craftsmanship eventually that um, speaks to your standard, right? Yeah, ab- 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 absolutely. And so just like, this, just like what I mentioned, that process is when you think of a building design from scratch, you look at an empty site or you look at a building you're renovating, mm-hmm. You know, you start with your broader ideas and then you kind of spiral down and then spiral back up and then spiral back down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, so I just want to make sure I got this right. And I'm going to ask these questions on behalf of the audience, I guess, or the listeners. Um, so what got you to this point of catapulting had to do with compartmentalizing these different parts of the process and honing in on each one individually and kind of looking at the goal that was just right in front of you at that moment, the problem that needed to be solved for at that moment. Yeah. And then as you broke it down in those smaller chunks and you were successful at each little milestone, then before you knew it, you were almost completing a marathon and you got really good at problem solving. So at the same time, you were building your technical skill, building towards that excellence is what I hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think what's uh, important here to add is the vision. Okay. Mm, okay. The, the catapult can only happen with a strong vision. The catapult happens like, okay, in my mind, I'm thinking in, in whatever the time frame is, a year, a two years, this is where we're going to be. So let's go get there. And then that's where the the where we start to fragment the goals and objectives to achieve that vision. And then you have to be unrelenting on that vision, unrelenting, because um, as an architect, there's small, but there's so many <laughs> factors that come in along the path that can really push you off your path. Mm-hmm. So you have to be unrelenting on that vision. Yeah. So give us an example. So for those of you who are watching the video version of this, I'm like taking notes because I'm loving, I, I love the illustrative language you use, which shouldn't be surprising because you are a designer, but I'm just thinking about this word catapult and vision. I love visioning. So tell me about, give me an example of when you had to be unrelenting in your vision and in your focus to get to those catapulting moments, because this is where I think people can get really off track. I work 
one-on-one with entrepreneurs in these situations all the time. And we have a certain scope and we have certain priorities we're focused on, but something always happens that wants to steer or pull the leader away. And it's so important as the entrepreneur, as the you know top leader in the organization that you model this commitment and this focus, right? And saying no to everything else. So give us an example of along the way here, when you were just before that catapulting moment, um, where people were trying to, or things, whatever, the universe is trying to pull you off track, but you were able to come back. Mm-hmm. Well, I, um, I, I, you know, there's a number of those moments, but perhaps in the beginning, one of my, uh, one of our first larger projects, our clients, they came to me and we were looking at planning a, a small um, city center, a very mm-hmm. urban, what we call pedestrian friendly, Mix of uses, retail, residential, and office. Um, and uh, so we were planning that project and just so happened uh, right across the street, they're planning another project. However, they weren't hiring us. They weren't as the architects. And, uh, but I did inquire as to why, uh, what they're doing. And uh, they were struggling. The same builder, like same developer group? Really, they, same developer, same client. Yeah, but they but hired they, us for we, one project. And they brought in somebody else, you know, to do the other. This is what happens sometimes. Okay. Yeah. And um, seems a little but, disjointed. Yeah, okay. it was disjointed. However, um, uh, given our technical, our my technical skills, and this was in the mountains, and I don't want to get too technical with you and the audience, but so the, they showed me. I said, "Well, can you show me what you're doing over there?" And they did, and it was. Uh, to me, it was a failure. Like it was a, a horrible. Uh, it wasn't a good solution in any any way, environmentally, design wise, to achieve that client's objectives. I said, "Hey, if you don't mind, I'd like to look at this a little bit and let me get back with you and show you some ideas." So they said, "Fine." So what we're able to do is when you're planning a large scale project. Uh, what I mean is multi acre projects. One of the horizontal or what we call the cut and fill, how you move, how much earth you need to bring in, how much earth you need to move Mm -hmm. is a significant factor, main factor in all of this. It's not necessarily high design, which is what we're known for, but we're a little bit like Michael Jordan. In other words, everyone thinks of Michael Jordan when he scores 60 points, but they don't think about how good he is on defense. Mm -hmm. So think of us like that a little bit. Got it. Well, I imagine if you don't have uh, the uh, foundation done properly right. that your buildings <laughs> right are very well. So I get that, the yeah, unsexy well, part. So yeah, it wasn't as sexy, but uh, it solved the problem. So what we were able to do is design the second project that we were involved in with and extract all the earth that we needed to make that new design work and fill it in on the project that we were originally hired for. So it's what we call balanced sites, which is the most ideal optimal relationship you want architecturally and financially speaking because you're you're saving earth you're not bringing in extra earth or or moving the earth in a, in a different way and um uh, so that catapulted us if you will to a whole nother level with our client like he had no idea we had that ability to look at it in that way so that was just one one of the catapult steps um, and, and, and another one here um, in Arizona, one of our, uh, we were hired to plan and design uh, a, a, a city center, small town center for a master plan community out here. Mm-hmm. And uh, the client at the time, uh, they purchased 9,000 acres originally. Um, our, our scope was uh, only 30 acres, but it was a, a significant part. Um, in any event, when I first met with them, you know, they had these grand vision statements in their office. Like we, we want to be one of the best developers in the country. You know, these uh, types of vision statements you would see. So um, in a client like this. So I, I took that at heart. I, I took that seriously. Yeah. And I told them that. I said, well, OK, if this is your mission, this is what we want to do. Let's go do it. Mm-hmm. So um what what happens along the way is um, sometimes you get so unrelenting on your vision. Uh, honestly, you're rubbing some people the wrong way, mm. you know, and um, not that you're ignoring them or you're not communicating with them, 
but um, to uh, educate people uh, into a new space, uh, especially in, a, in, a, in an environment that um, uh, hasn't seen innovation, planning and design innovation, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. So uh, what we hit on, what I hit on was that, um, okay, I can't be a traditional architect here. I can't just design a beautiful building and present it to them and they're going to love it and approve it and, and you know everyone's going to be happy. It's not going to work like this. And uh, because they're not going to understand the intent. So we backed up and we said, okay, everyone loves a good story. Everyone loves a good story that they can understand and they contribute. So I abandoned all the architectural vocabulary and all the uh, illustrative language that you mentioned, all the colorful yes. <laughs> architectural language. I said, let's get rid of all that. Okay, let's just tell a good story. And so what we did is on that specific project, we, uh, I spent a couple of months just doing research of, of the history of the area. It was sort of old, originally it was a working ranch and, and all this and family. So basically what I did is I wrote a screenplay, a fictional story based on factual information. And we presented that story and timeline to our client. Uh, in a design meeting as a, as a framework. So uh, what, I want to be careful how I present this to you and the audiences. It wasn't where we wanted to um, uh, be fictional. We want to, we, we love respecting history, but we want to uh, be innovative and in looking towards the future. Sure. And, uh, well, but, and I'm sure there were gaps you had to fill like information gaps, you know, like, and so they do that all the time. Right. And like, true story, like movies or documentaries or whatever they're, they're forced to and, and to make it more engaging. Right. So, yeah. so just, I just want to make sure that I got this. So instead of like, Hey, you guys are the architect, we're the developers, we're going to hire you. Like, let's do this big project. And you show up with the screenplay instead of like, you know, drawings or something. Well, okay. we, had, we had drawings <laughs> to reinforce the screenplay. Okay. This and, is incredible. So yeah. you realized that you wanted to take them through an experience of living in the community, in the development that you guys were about to create. Yes. And then the, the beautiful thing about that is then they started participating in the story. They're like, well, Peter, if this happened, then why should this should have happened? Right. Mm -hmm. And so the the story was simply a framework and then everyone can get engaged. And then yeah. sometimes as an architect, um, uh, I, I, if we present something, people feel timid telling us that they won't, they don't like something or they don't like mm -hmm. a color or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. with the story, I removed myself from that position altogether. Mm -hmm. And it was all about the story, not about Peter. Yeah. Or Circle West Architects. And then then at that point, once everyone got engaged in the story, we were off to the races. We couldn't finish that project fast enough with them. They, wow. they, they, yeah, they loved it. This is so cool on so many levels because not only did you kind of, well, you use this design in this whole new way, but it's also really cool for all my salespeople um, listening in, which any entrepreneur is ultimately also a salesperson. Um, and what a cool way to kind of change the dynamic of essentially a pitch, right? You're there like with your proposal in a sense, like, okay, can we do this project together? Can we do this work? Here's what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And you have literally just shifted the way that they engage with you and ultimately the dynamic of the us versus them that kind of exists yeah, in those kind of pitches. And you guys are now collaborative. So you've already just like moved past the gate of like, will we be working together in some way? It's like, oh, we're, we are starting to work together right now as we engage and read the story together. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we'll change a little bit of the character over here and this and that, but like we're already doing it. That is really cool. Yeah. Really, really cool. So for those of you listening that have issues with that in your pitch or you get really nervous or whatever, you just literally brought yourself on the same side of the table with the client right away. Very yeah. cool. It, and it's, at that point, it's a conversation. And then someone who have an idea on the story, we would go with it. 
we'd take their idea and run with it. And right. just, because we're fortunate creatively design wise, that's our superpower, right? Sure. So we don't need to unleash that all the time. And uh, so, but when we do, you know, it's wrapped around these ideas. How fun too, to, to take your client and make them such a um, kind of paramount part of the process to, because everybody kind of wants their legacy. They want their mark in some way. And so, you know, how I do that in my work is I, I really try to get everybody engaged in the actual decisions that are made. And like, I don't need, I remove myself from needing any kind of credit or having any kind of ego in it, because ultimately I'm just there to help them reach their highest and best goals. And it's a way better for everybody if they were central to that, not me. I don't ever want to. So in the same vein, right? How fun for them to be part of the design instead of you just kind coming and saying, okay, here's what we've done. What changes do you want to see? Right. And then there's this weird back and forth via email. No one really understands what each other's trying to do. Um, but you've really made them central to it, engaged in it, bought in. And now at the end of the day, they get to say, oh yeah, like I was part of this and look at how amazing it is. People, yep. re- clients really love to have that experience. So yeah, we, we, I like to call that experiential design. Experiential so, design. Okay. So we, we we focus on um, the experiences, the people, the the emotions, the memories, and then we we craft the architectural environment around those big ideas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because uh, what I tell my clients is, you know, we, we all get attracted to um, you know a beautiful piece of art or a beautiful car or. But that doesn't mean it's right for this project, you know? And uh, so you got to like pierce through that I- immediate, like, oh, I love this, and then mm-hmm. get deeper into that experience. Got it. The Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Hotel is one of our clients. And with them, we've learned that um, from an experience standpoint, you have 1.7 seconds to make a positive or negative emotion when someone touches a door handle. When someone comes in the front door of a hotel or the room, you have 1.7 seconds. Consciously or subconsciously, someone's gonna make a decision. And if it's uh, a negative decision, uh, it takes a lot of work to get them back into the positive. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's, it's how, how we process our design thinking. Right. And nowadays, I'd say it even happens before then. I mean, I just got back from Palm Springs and I was shopping online and I literally picked, and this is so interesting because I thought of you because we had already spoke before I went there. Um, I chose based on the building and based on the photos, but it was so unique. It was so architecturally unique compared to um, you know, the other buildings that were more, um, I guess, traditional, um, like legacy type buildings for Palm Springs, like the colony or the Parker or whatever. But this was really interesting and fresh and new. And if I feel like that aligns with me or my personality or something I want to be associated with, I'm going to select that property. Isn't that interesting though? Like I made that decision a month before I even set foot in that town. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And, you know, that those are along the lines of what we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, it, yeah. it, and if you, that's why we work with our clients, understand who are the people, uh, what are they trying to do? What's their business plan, uh, long or short term, and just look at those objectives uh, mm-hmm. and develop the design wrapped uh, in, 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 in rooted in those ideas. That's right. So, so for you, and in that, in a type of project like that, you not only have to understand the client, the developer in front of you, and make sure you're resonating with them, but also their end customer and client and how they're going to interact and engage with the space. Yeah, because yeah, that's also yeah. who you're who you're trying to serve. This is so interesting. Just like we have gone so far off <laughs> with the questions that I thought we were going to go, but these stories are so interesting. So thank you so much for showing up and being willing to go off script and, and, um, you know, candidly, um, 
and show up for the uh, the interview today. I want to ask you one question because this is important. Uh, so many of my audience members are in this place. Um, I work with a lot of people who are technical experts at what they do. So we're talking about that level of mastery and excellence at your craft. I work with so many people who are just like that. And now they are entering into this next phase of growth for their business, that catapult, if you will, um, where now they're going to be a manager. So they have spent a lot and a lot of time, time, you know, executing and being in that space of what they're technically an expert at. But now they have grown to this place where so much of their time is going to be spent managing people and their team. And I know that you have approached, you have reached this place where you have a team and you have to spend a decent amount of time managing and leading. What was that transition, that transition like for you? And what are like one or two things that really stood out that either, either were early failings that you learned from or have been successes that have helped um, helped continue to grow the business? Well, that's a big one. What you meant, that's... I, yeah, no big deal. Just answer that in five minutes. Yeah, I, I, struggled, <laughs> I struggled with that for like years, honestly, that, that, that because... Uh, just as you say, you spend all these years, um, you know, fine tuning yourself, educating yourself, getting the ex- expertise, getting the experience, um, doing all the work to to reach that pinnacle for yourself, and then you reach a point in an organization like, okay, uh, now I have to manage, I have to transfer this, and um, uh, so for me, it was a little bit. Um, I, I always like the Michael uh, Jordan analogy, uh, and uh, you know, any any night I could put up sixty points if I wanted to. You know, that's no problem for me. Mm-hmm. And I always looked at my teammates like, "Well, what's the problem? Uh, why can't you hit sixty? You know, tonight." Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was it was a challenge. And quite honestly, I, I probably uh, at that point wasn't a good manager. You know, to be honest with you, I, I failed a number of times with different people. Um, Thanks for saying that, because I do not want this show to ever be a place where people feel like, no, I just, I knew exactly what to do. Like the truth is is that you don't and you got to try it out and you don't nail it the first few times and people, they, they quit, they move on or whatever. They don't like it, you know? Yeah. Um, So thanks for being willing to say that. Yeah. I mean, everyone, you know, know, everyone's different and how they look at things. And like, for me as an architect, I mean, I've, I've only wanted to be an architect since I was a kid. You know, I never wanted to do anything else. So all my off time was trying to be an architect, uh, you know, and better at it, learning, reading all that. And then, uh, being a manager, I struggled with like, okay, why can't they understand it as quickly as I do? Why can't they do this? I don't mean to be, uh, like that. And, um, quite honestly, after uh, a couple of people left our group, our team, our firm, because of this in part, you know, not all of it, but I'm sure in part, you know, I had to take a step back myself. I'm like, Peter, you know, this isn't working. You know, uh, you might be Michael Jordan, but you got to rethink this whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So then um, getting back to uh, the Bulls is they started what they call the triangle offense. And it took a while for Michael Jordan to understand and adapt and trust his teammates with the triangle offense uh, because he had to share the ball around, around. So the was it he and Scotty Pippen? Scotty Pippen. And Tony? Tony Kukoc, but he came a little bit later. Correct. Okay, who was the third? Uh, well, there are a number of different people. Uh, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Steve Kerr. He's, uh, he's a coach now. Um, and uh, I forget all the other uh, players offhand, but the idea is that, uh, so I had to take a step back and I had to think about, okay, what do I want to do? Like, where do I want to go? Where do I want to go with the company? How do I want to see this company? So, um, uh, and a little bit is what I realized is our, our processes of thinking are unarchitectural. So what I mean by that is, um, I like to think of ourselves as a tech company. And, and partly is um, because as an architect, you're trained uh, in, a, in a very different way of thinking, okay? Uh, I, I like, uh, 
I like putting pressure on myself, what I call positive pressure, where you're you're growing, you're challenging yourself, and you're moving, you're moving along at a healthy pace. Right. So years ago, I heard this quote of uh, the speed at which uh, tech companies work. Okay, generally speaking, is goes something like this: is you 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 accelerate uh, twice as fast every six months at half the cost. So that phrase is embedded in my mind, okay, every day. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, Peter, how are we innovating? What are we doing? What are you doing? How are you treating your team? Uh, how are you educating your people? So where I'm going with all this is um, what I realized is um, uh, uh, there's a certain type of mindset that I look for to join our team, but, you know, generally speaking, I mean, there's a wide range of you're wrong. Um, and um, there's certain cues that I look for in a person's personality or, or you know, how they speak and how they think that I could see where they would be successful, not where they need to do everything in our firm, but certain how we communicate and how we organize. Right. right. So um, uh, that type of, so getting back to what we speak, spoke about earlier about problem solving, Sometimes you get locked into an idea and you're so locked into the idea, you can't pivot. And sometimes you need to pivot very quickly, drop whatever you were thinking and move on. Mm. And uh, that, that type of thinking is what I like to uh, embed and, and nurture in our group. Because so, so if that's so in order to kind of like be successful in this new place, as the in this leadership role versus just the architectural um, role, you had to hire for people with this mindset in order to be able to delegate, innovate, solve problems, create process in the way that you knew would grow your company your company successfully. Yeah, and then I invested. Yeah, then I invested heavily in our processes, mm. super heavily, like yeah. our culture how we think, how we communicate, how we communicate internally, how we communicate externally, uh, the, these types of uh, aspects is super amazing. Important. So, yeah. so important. Um, I love hearing that you committed to those investments because so oftentimes that's where people don't want to invest. They don't see the return and it just, it just stops you, you know, it just stops you from having those like monumental growth um, that you could have, um, but people want that direct return on investment and it just doesn't work that way. Um, you, I, I wish we had another hour. We don't, I like to keep these this length so that people actually click on them. If we had a three hour interview, people might not listen to you. Um, so many awesome nuggets of wisdom there. Thank you so much for being willing to pop on and share with us. Maybe we'll have to do a second round because I know we're just kind of getting started and maybe we'll let you drink a full coffee first and then see where that, <laughs> where that takes us. So, well, thank you to everyone listening, but thank you so much, Peter, for coming on, sharing your insights, your eye-opening moments with us over your 30-year entrepreneurial journey and congrats on your 30-year anniversary coming up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. You. For those of you guys tuning in, we you'll see in the show notes, we're going to highlight the specific um, parts in the interview that really stood out as insights. We're going to share links so that you guys could get in touch with Peter and yeah, reach out if you have some fun design questions. So thanks again, guys, for joining us and catch you on the next episode. Thanks for joining us this week on Eye Openers. Make sure to visit brittanydroz.com slash podcast for this week's show notes. And if you found value in today's episode, I would so appreciate you giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts or share it with a friend. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This all helps to support the show.